Dave Stouffer. Welcome to episode number 10 of J.C.'s World, starring the Reverend Mr. J.C., who is the hero, or not such a hero as some people have found out, of book number one in my series, The Reverend Mr. J.C. This one is subtitled, When Appearances Are Not Enough. J.C. has gone from fighting Pastor James' every demand to something beyond respect. Love, maybe? And now. Pastor James had enjoyed the holiday season as much as any person could, facing his own mortality. He had been taking chemotherapy and had more treatments to face. John, he said, I heard that crap is rat poison. I don't know if that's true, but it sure does make you feel like dying. J.C. said, just hang in there, my friend. We need to trust the doctor and we need to trust in God. You know, John, I ain't afraid of dying. I know where I'm headed. But as glorious as heaven will be, there are so many parts of life on earth that I will really miss. James didn't spend much time feeling sorry for himself, but he was an impatient patient. James politely refused Ruth's help because he was uncomfortable around women, particularly the thought of them helping him with personal care. So that left J.C. People brought in food. Once a week, people came to clean. James would rally to put on a good face, particularly when people were around. He would seem like his old self, chatting and enjoying a story. But at night, James would be sick, sometimes shamefully so. J.C. had rigged a buzzer between James' bedroom and his, but J.C. slept with one ear open. Sometimes James could get up on his own. Sometimes he didn't quite make it, and nauseated, he would make a mess. The sounds or smells of someone being sick triggered the same reaction in J.C. Often they would see the difficult humor in this situation and share a laugh while J.C. cleaned up James and then himself, and then put James back to bed. J.C. was still doing all the work of ministry that he had discovered under James' tutelage. He was in Prophetstown Miners Hospital one afternoon when Nurse Potter stopped him. J.C. was still frightened of her. She had the sort of stocky body you automatically associate with athletic prowess, and J.C. knew she had a reputation in the hospital for being fair but tough. Reverend Wesley, I heard Pastor James is sick. What's the deal? J.C. told her the story. I suppose him being such a darn good man, you got people lined up to help you take care of him. Well, Nurse Potter, J.C. began, Maggie, name's Margaret, call me Maggie. Okay, Maggie. We do just fine with people helping clean the parsonage, and it seems there's an ever-ending supply of food, but James is, well, kind of shy about having women around him. He was in the army, wasn't he, Pastor John, never married? That's right. He told me that ministry took all of his time and attention, and it wouldn't be fair to a woman or to kids. I think he's been happy, not married. <laughs> Maggie laughed. Sounds like Pastor James and I have some things in common. I just found it easier to be alone, too. Anyway, she continued, you're taking care of Pastor James? I know that you're burning the candle at both ends. I'd like to help you out. Well, that's a very nice offer, Nurse Potter, Maggie. But I don't think James would stand for that. Let me be the judge of that, me and Pastor James, that is. What? There isn't anything he's got or any bodily function he can perform that I ain't seen. I did 20 years as a nurse in the Army. I'm not afraid of anything he can say or do. Let me talk to him. How about if I come over after work? Maggie, why don't you come over and eat with us tonight? We can talk about it. J.C. was a little afraid of Maggie Potter and a little fearful of what James Edwards would think. Should I just spring her on him? Would it be fair to tell him? But if that got him all stirred up, would James even let her in the house? In the end, he decided James was gentleman enough to let her in the house, feed her supper, and then politely tell her no, thank you, and he, J.C., would have to hear about it a little after she'd gone. James was in the recliner reading when J.C. returned to the parsonage. James, are you up to a little company this evening? You bet. Nothing against your conversation, John, but it might be nice to have somebody different to talk to. 
Do you remember Nurse Potter? James thought. Oh, yes, the one you impressed. I've seen her over the years, but I wouldn't say we're friends. Just acquaintances. Is she coming over? Mm, well, <laughs> mm, yes, she is. Is there something you want to tell me, John? I know when you're trying to hide something. All right, James, I guess I'll have to tell you. When J.C. mentioned Maggie helping with James' care, James' head couldn't have spoken no any louder than he was by nodding it. So I invited her over for supper so we could, you know, talk about it. J.C.'s voice trailed to a stop. Well, said James, it'll be nice to see a different face. But if she's thinking that she's going to be my nurse, she better find something else to think about. He roughed himself up in his chair, picked up his book, and stared at the page until J.C. left the room. Supper time at the parsonage with homemade beef and noodles, some light as air biscuits, strawberry jam, and three people sitting at the kitchen table. Maggie Potter had changed out of her nurse's whites and was wearing slacks and a sweater. Her hair, J.C. noticed for the first time, was a beautiful shade of auburn, complemented by her hunter green sweater. She'd obviously taken some pains for the visit. Heard you was in the army, James. It was either a question or a challenge. James took it as a question. Yes, I was. Well, what'd you do? Where were you at? James gave her the basic outline of his military service. You know, James, I could have been at Fort Leonard Wood Army Community Hospital when you were there. What years were you at that post? James figured it up. Then, how could you have been there? Twenty years in the nursing corps, retired a captain. James perked up. You did? You were in the service? An officer? Well, maybe I saluted you once. That was a long time ago, James, for both of us. Yes, it was, said James. Yes, it was. Nice to think about it, though. Well, James, said Maggie, here's what I've got in my mind. I've been an army nurse. I've seen it all. Pastor John told me you were a little antsy about women taking care of you, but I'm a nurse and I'm a soldier. I've got some time built up at the hospital. Never saw much need to take vacation. And I know that Pastor John's been working his tail off all day long and then sleeping with one eye and one ear open at night. So I'm thinking you ought to let me hang around a little bit, just so Pastor John would have some rest, so he could do his job better. No, don't think so. But I appreciate your offer, Nurse Potter. Appreciate it very much. So, James, what rank were you in the Army? asked Nurse Potter. Sergeant. I guess you know the difference between a sergeant and a captain. The look on James' face showed he knew where this was going. Yes, ma'am, he replied. I do. Well, James, don't make me pull rank on you. Rather than just ordering you to let me come over here, let's do a tryout. Well, first of all, Maggie, how much will this cost me? I would want to pay my own way. That's the last thing we're going to talk about, James. More important than pay is, are we going to be able to work together? I'll make you a deal, James. I'll come over here tomorrow night and sleep on the couch. I'll do that till the end of the week, and then you tell me if I should come back any more. Deal? James thought. Well, I suppose it would be easier for John with a little help, but I'd still get to say what you can help with and what you can't. Sure, replied Maggie. And one other thing, said James, I'm not going to be mamming you all over the place. Maggie laughed. You don't even have to salute me, Sergeant. That was Monday. On Tuesday, Maggie showed up about supper time. They ate together, and then J.C. had a call to make. Maggie and James were alone. When J.C. came back, Maggie was sitting in the living room reading a magazine and James was reading a book. The bedroom had been tidied. At bedtime, J.C. got some blankets and a pillow for Maggie, who insisted on sleeping on the couch. As James got into bed, he asked J.C. to close the door so that woman won't be looking at me in my pajamas. By Thursday, James was asking for fresh pajamas before supper. Friday, he wanted his razor at about five o'clock so he could mow this stuff off my face. 
I just feel like I should shave more often. When J.C. and James were eating their Sunday dinner, James opened the subject of Maggie Potter. Well, I think I've been more than fair, John. I gave her the time she wanted to try out the situation, and there are some things I don't like about it. J.C.'s heart sank. He had greatly appreciated Maggie's help. Do you want me to tell her thanks, but no thanks? No, no, James protested. I just think we need to make it easier for her. What do you mean easier, James? Well, sleeping on that couch. We've got the other bedroom, the one I was sleeping in upstairs, so why couldn't we turn that over to her and let her bring in a few things? Great idea, James. What else? Well, paying her. She's a professional. She's due her wage. We'll talk to her about it, James. Yes, we will. And there's one other thing. She needs some time off, too, working all day and being on call here all night. J.C. didn't point out that's what he'd been doing. In fact, he saw some humor in James making peace with the situation by being in charge. So J.C. smiled. Late Sunday afternoon, Maggie Potter appeared, hung up her coat in a closet, and found James sitting in his recliner with a determined expression on his face. Now see here, Maggie. You can hang around if you want. As a matter of fact, I kind of... I kind of enjoy having you around. Didn't think I'd ever say that. And I've asked John to put clean sheets on my old room upstairs so you can stay up there. Well, James, that's very kind, but I'd prefer to stay down here closer to you so I can take care of you when you need it. I just don't feel right you working all day and then sleeping on that couch at night. Well, what if I asked John to fix that buzzer so it rings in my room? My room? Well, you know what I mean, your old room. For some reason or another, that triggered a smile on both their faces. And then there's time off and pay. James, I've already talked to the hospital and I've got a month paid vacation saved up. Why don't we talk again at the end of that time? I could even take a leave of absence. And being on vacation, I'll have the daytime free to take care of whatever I need to do and be here at night. James didn't have any objections that Maggie didn't have an answer for. Maggie moved some things into the upstairs bedroom, came at supper time, and stayed through the night. Sometimes when J.C. wakened in the night, he would hear conversation from the room beneath him. And before long, James' conversations with J.C. were filled with Maggie this and Maggie that. You know, John, she's pretty easy to talk to. Before the month came to a close, Maggie was spending most days at the parsonage, too. And sometimes when J.C. walked into the room, it was like interrupting a couple of teenagers with their heads close together, sharing intimate glances. He even caught them holding hands a couple of times. When he asked James how he felt about Maggie, James answered, You know, I don't hate women. I've had to talk to and listen to plenty as a minister. Maggie seems to, seems to know what I want to talk about. We agree about things, but... But you just mind your own business, John. Darned if James wasn't happy, thought J.C. Fighting for his life, sick as a dog, James Edwards was happy. Maybe even in love. And Maggie, what about her? Well, she had told J.C. that she'd never found a man she wanted to be around all the time. But she was practically living at the parsonage. And it wasn't just nursing. She wanted to be with James, wanted to hear his voice wanted to see his face, wanted to explore his thoughts. When the month was up, Maggie took a leave of absence from the Prophetstown Miners Hospital. Somehow an arrangement was made between James and Maggie. J.C. wasn't even consulted. As a matter of fact, he sometimes felt he was in the way. And in spite of the chemotherapy and the disease-eating James' body, the parsonage was a happy place. J.C. was working on Sunday's sermon when he heard James buzzer. Well, I, um, James seemed at a loss for words, almost embarrassed. Well, sit down, sit down, John. You probably think I'm pretty stupid. J.C. immediately knew what they were going to talk about. Stupid? No, I don't think you're stupid. You read and write and everything. You know what I mean, uh, me and Maggie. Surely you've noticed it's not just nurse and patient relationship here. 
I have noticed a little quiet talk and a little hand-holding. J.C. was smiling. It's nothing to laugh about, John. James, you're trying to tell me that you finally found a woman that you like spending time with, one you can have secret conversations with, and one who can finish your sentences. Am I close? It's, it's really amazing, John. We both have all these thoughts and all these experiences, and when we say them to each other, we understand. She puts up with me. She thinks I'm funny. I only wish that I'd spent more time talking to her these last years. Maybe something different could have happened, but something different is happening now, isn't it, James? I I've talked to a lot of people about love, trying to help them understand what it was, what it wasn't, and, and now I think I've found it. James sighed. When this cancer came along, I knew that it wasn't going to be easy. Then God sent me Maggie. Why couldn't he have sent me her years ago? James blew his nose. I'm going to die, John. I'm not afraid of dying, but I don't want to. These last weeks have been perfect. I could see spending the rest of my life if I was going to have the rest of my life with Maggie. So here I am with new feelings in my heart, and here she is with new awakened feelings in her heart, and I don't want to leave her alone. All those times when I sat with somebody losing their partner in life, and now I really know what it's like. What am I going to do, John? I guess the fairest thing would be to set her free, send her away, but I'm selfish. I don't want to. She does more than clean up after me when I make a mess. She is life to me. The tears were running down James' face. J.C. said a silent prayer for guidance, and then he said, Have you talked about this with Maggie? No, I'm afraid if I do, she'd leave, thinking that's what I want, and that's not what I want, but I do, and I don't. James, if you share so much so well, then the love that you have for each other and the love that you have for God will give you the answer. You need to talk with her and with God. Wow, John, you sound like me. Yeah, I guess I listened some of those times when you talked to me. There's absolutely no harm, James, if the two of you are in love and being together, but you need to talk about it. Maggie's an adult. She's smart. She will know the risks. It will be what God wants it to be. It makes me sad that there is a possibility that your time together is short. But it's thrilling that you can both enjoy this right now. That's the way I feel too, John. It's the best possible feeling. Even with the pain and tiredness, I listen for her step. I look forward to her coming into the room. I can't imagine, John, how hard it's been for you to live without your Ruth these months. Now it was J.C.'s turn to blow his nose. Look at us snuffling around like babies, both of us with women we love and who love us. Every breath we take with them around should be considered a bonus. They both sat, smiling, until James nodded off, and J.C. went to call Ruth to tell her how much he loved her. He was back in his office, lost in thought and deep in prayer when there was a knock on his door. He found Maggie standing there. Her cheeks were rosy. She'd obviously just come in from the cold January day. Can I come in? Can we talk? J.C. began to smile as Maggie, obviously uncomfortable, sat down. J.C. went to his desk. Maggie, he asked, still smiling, is this talk going to be like the one I had just an hour or so ago with that high school sophomore in the downstairs bedroom? <laughs> Maggie giggled. You noticed, huh? It would be pretty hard not to, Maggie. It's kind of embarrassing, John. I've never lost my professional detachment before. I knew of James Edwards for years. I found him easy to visit with when I ran into him, but I never considered getting to know him. You told me once, Maggie, you never found a man you considered spending your life with. I quit looking. My work is very satisfying. I never thought of looking at James Edwards as a companion. And then, 
there he was. Everything that I didn't know that I was looking for. He's not particularly handsome, but he's honest, gentle, full of compassion. Maggie paused. J.C. waited as he had when talking to James. Maggie went on. There's a rough side. I could see how he did well in the army, but there's a quiet side. He's a good listener. Maggie James believes that God brought you into his life. That's something else I'm learning, John. When you see what I do and you're trained in sciences, it's hard to believe in something you can't touch or see or smell. I've never been much for God. I don't think I'm a bad person, but James hasn't been preaching to me, but the way he explains it, the way he shows it, you have to believe there's something real. We've talked for hours about everything. I've seen more than my share of people die, and, and I know James is going to die. And I know there's nothing I can do about it. I accept that. But I hate it. This man has so much to give. There are so many who hurt instead of help, who take instead of give, and they live. And here's this gentle, sweet man who's going to die. And I'll tell you something else, John. And here Maggie looked directly into J.C.'s eyes as if she was ready to argue. Right or wrong, I believe that I am in love with him. And he believes he's in love with you, Maggie, J.C. responded. It's a tragedy that James will not live to be a very old man, but we both know he won't. What we do know is what he has given to people over the years. There won't be a statue to James Edwards, but there will be many lives that he's touched and changed. Do you know what he asked me this afternoon? She shook her head no. He asked me if he should set you free because he knew he was going to die. I don't believe he's ever felt for any woman like he does for you, and yet he is willing to take more pain upon himself to protect you from a love too short. J.C. didn't know what to expect. He thought Maggie would cry. She did look teary. He really didn't expect to hear, well, he'll not get rid of me that easy. He doesn't want to get rid of you. He wants to protect you from the hurt of his death. They both looked at the swirls of frost forming on the windows as the sun began to set. I know my heart will break, but it's not like it'll be a surprise. And we are packing so much into the time that we have that I feel fulfilled. I would have liked 50 years with him, but you go with what you get. And I never thought that I'd get what I've got. So I'm going to stay here as a nurse, as a girlfriend, as a wife in spirit, if not in truth, till death do us part. Now let's go feed that man some supper. And look at those seed catalogs that came today. I know you both want to. Who would have thought that J.C. could find this kind of strength within himself? That Pastor James could have found this kind of happiness even in the face of death? And that Nurse Potter had such tenderness hidden inside of a steel exterior? As in all of our lives, God plants lots of surprises. Join me next time for episode number 11 from J.C.'s World posted by the Washington Free Public Library. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dave Stouffer.